This is Khalil Jashan uh, from Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to the center and specifically to this uh, special webinar today entitled Libya's Upcoming Elections and Prospects for Democratic Transition. Uh, although it might uh, be too, assuming too much when we say <laughs> Libya's upcoming elections, uh, considering uh, the news today, which I will refer to uh, uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, let me make a few introductory remarks, uh, and then I will introduce our great uh, panel today uh, to help us decipher uh, the, the problem facing uh, Libya and the Libyan people uh, with regards to the uh, rumored uh, or planned uh, elections that are only uh, a little over a week. Uh, away, but uh, after a, uh, a decade of, of conflict, decade plus of conflict uh, in Libya following the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi, uh, the government of national unity uh, formed by a uh, UN facilitated dialogue back in March uh, of this year has been asked uh, tasked with, with, with leading uh, the country's presidential and parliamentary elections in a somewhat convoluted mixed uh, fashion, uh, multi-staged uh, uh, elections. The first round uh, of these uh, Libyan uh, presidential elections uh, are supposed to or are scheduled to take place on December 24th, as, as I said, uh, in eight days, while the legislative elections have been postponed uh, until January, 30 days after the uh, presidential elections. Uh, as we know, uh, between November uh, 7th and the third week of, of uh, November the, on the 22nd, uh, 98 people have registered uh, as candidates. Uh, 96 men and two women uh, did register or go through the process. Allegedly, some of them, uh, although I'm, I'm not sure about the formality of this, about 24 or so of them were, they were uh, allegedly disqualified by the High National Elections Commission for failure to meet uh, different requirements or conditions for candidacy, including, for example, having a criminal record or uh, cases uh, in court against them, uh, having dual citizenship uh, and so on. But the, the situation has never been settled uh, clearly and appeals uh, continue uh, to be presented uh, to the judiciary as, as we speak. Now, uh, while these elections are viewed uh, as uh, crucial uh, by, by most observers uh, of Libya uh, for the country's future and path toward uh, unification, uh, democratic governance, uh, and so on, they do take place, however, amid uh, numerous challenges uh, facing the country, such as uh, recurrent violence, uh, political fragmentation, uh, uh, warring armed groups that haven't given up yet, uh, deteriorating economic and health conditions. And uh, not the least uh, of all is the interference, continued interference uh, by external uh, forces, including some uh, military uh, forces that continue uh, to exist on Libyan uh, soil. So uh, this morning, frankly, when, when, when you look at the news uh, from Libya, things are not very encouraging with regard uh, to the elections. Uh, I was just uh, looking before we just started at two news items that uh, came to my uh, attention. Uh, one is by Reuters uh, saying the title of which was Libyans in dark over election with eight days to go. I mean, how can you have meaningful democratic elections eight days uh, before the election is, uh, is scheduled for, and yet the public is in the dark, uh, not knowing who the, what's the final uh, candidates list? Uh, uh, what are the, uh, the, the circumstances? So there we are eight days uh, before Libyans uh, are meant to cast their presidential votes, yet there is utter confusion over the fate of an election uh, that has not yet been formally delayed, even though most experts, including members of the uh, electoral commission that I referred to earlier, uh, one of them told Al Jazeera last night, it will be impossible to hold these elections on time. And so th things do not look uh, you know, very uh, clear and, and, and secure in terms of what was planned for December uh, 24. Uh, the Libyan Electoral Commission, as I said, has not even released the final list 
of eligible candidates uh, that were registered uh, to participate in these elections. The second news item that attracted my attention this morning is by Axios as entitled Libya Elections. Likely delay raises fears of renewed conflict. And that kind of, you know, in a way defeats the purpose uh, of these elections when everybody was hoping that that would signal uh, the end of this violent period uh, in the modern history uh, of Libya, trying to adjust uh, to, to the change and to the uh, developments of, of the past uh, 10 years. So uh, according to Axios, Libya's December 24th presidential election is now all but certain to be postponed due to a dispute over who can run, raising fears that a period of relative calm will soon come to an end. In other words, the, the people are questioning, if you will, people interviewed in the article were questioning that this rushed uh, winner take all election in the deeply divided country would most probably spark renewed uh, conflict. This webinar will offer an opportunity for us to examine uh, the, these, these questions. Uh, of course, first and foremost, try to answer the, the questions uh, that are implied in these news uh, items uh, about Libya. Will the elections take place on December 24th? And it, uh, uh, it behooves us uh, to, to discuss that uh, and why and, and what type of options uh, does the commission have and how would that impact uh, the legitimacy, if you will, and the credibility of elections if uh, they were to be uh, postponed officially. Uh, do these elections present really a window of opportunity to achieve significant positive change uh, in this post-conflict Libya? What are the prospects for ending the violence uh, that have dogged the, the country for so long? Uh, can the elections uh, under these conditions be truly transparent, democratic, and fair? Uh, while foreign interference uh, is continuing uh, in, in, in Libya. And uh, what steps do our panelists as experts uh, recommend for ending this foreign interference and move forward uh, toward a democratic model of governance uh, in uh, Libya? Uh, to help us answer these questions and, and uh, decipher these issues, uh, we are very lucky uh, this morning or this afternoon, depends on your location or this evening, uh, to have four excellent uh, observers and experts uh, on Libya with a range of uh, wide range of experience uh, in, in different uh, fields from, from academic to, to human rights, uh, to uh, practitioners, uh, activists uh, who have been involved uh, think tank work uh, who have been involved in this conflict uh, all along. So we hope to be able to have first a constructive discussion of, of the elections, but also help you uh, decipher some of these uh, issues uh, that uh, I raised in my introductory remarks. Uh, we have four speakers, uh, each of whom will have uh, 12 minutes uh, to present their prepared remarks. Uh, that should leave us a balance of about 30 minutes at the end, uh, where we will engage in the art of conversation and uh, have a Q&A uh, session, uh, giving you, the audience, a chance uh, to raise uh, your questions uh, with uh, our uh, panelists. Uh, the order uh, of the panelists will be uh, as follows. First, we'll begin with uh, uh, Anas uh, Al-Kumati, uh, who uh, is the founder and director of the Sadiq Institute uh, in uh, Libya. Uh, uh, Anas uh, is known uh, for his uh, credible research on socioeconomic uh, issues uh, in the region and, and particularly in Libya, issues uh, pertaining to secularization, security issues, uh, and political uh, Islam. Uh, so he will cover the, the questions uh, that I've raised in addition, uh, hopefully help us with the kind of uh, uh, the electoral process in terms of his own assessment of that and potential for free, uh, fair and transparent elections. Uh, Anas will be followed by Hanan Salah, who is the Libya Director for Human Rights Watch. Uh, she's a well-known researcher uh, on uh, MENA with a focus on, uh, on, on Libya, Libyan issues, uh, with, as I said, the years of experience and particularly, I think, uh, of, of important importance to our discussion today 
in investigating human rights abuses in Libya and, and whether the process we're going through will ho hopefully alleviate uh, the, the dismal uh, situation we have seen uh, in this uh, area. Uh, after Hanan, we'll pass on the microphone to Azhara Langi, uh, who is a renowned uh, peace activist, uh, expert on uh, gender issues, uh, on conflict resolution, on peace building, uh, particularly uh, in uh, Libya. Uh, she is the co-founder and the CEO of uh, Libyan Women's Platform for Peace. And from that uh, perspective, she will help us not only understand, again, uh, the basic logistics, of, of the elections, but help us with understanding the uh, needed, uh, whether implemented or not, uh, series of reforms uh, that are needed in the electoral system, uh, particularly with regards to women's participation uh, in these elections and in the political parties engaging uh, or engaged uh, in these elections. Last but not least, our good friend Tim uh, Eaton, uh, Senior Research Fellow, Middle East and, and North Africa Program, at Chatham House. Uh, his research has uh, uh, focused over the years on the political economy uh, of the uh, Libyan uh, conflict. Uh, I remember an author authoritative report that he authored a couple of years back, 2018, uh, essentially on Libya's war uh, economy and uh, linking uh, economic activities uh, with uh, growing violence uh, in, uh, in the country. So he will be looking at the situation in Libya uh, from that perspective. As I said, each uh, speaker will have 10 to 12 minutes uh, and then we'll open up uh, for uh, Q&A. Uh, you may uh, send your questions uh, through the Zoom uh, page, uh, the Q&A uh, Zoom uh, button at the bottom of the page. Uh, the questions will come to me. I will read them and address them uh, to the uh, right uh, panelists. Uh, you may also, uh, for those who are watching us uh, on other than Zoom, uh, you may email your question to events at arabcenterdc.org, events at arabcenterdc.org. Please identify yourself, your affiliation, and uh, basically to whom you are addressing uh, your uh, question. And uh, with that, uh, let me go ahead and go to our first panelist, uh, Anas uh, al -Kumati. Anas, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Khalil, and thank you to the Arab Center for hosting us uh, this morning, this afternoon. Um, for what is really a curious kind of question, which I think you, you put out in very eloquent terms that, you know, that Libyans are essentially in the dark. Um, I think all of us are in the dark and um, with the time that remains uh, for these scheduled elections, uh, eight days, it feels like I've had more time to prepare to catch an Uber than to call for elections and prepare for these elections. So I think all of us are, are kind of scratching our head as to, you know, why the delays are there. But I think to kind of paint the picture as it is, it, you know, it, it is a really curious question. And I think we should also ask why we're having presidential elections first. And I think to do that, we need to go back to the, um, the source of this conflict and understand the last several years um, as the actors in the conflict, um, have outlined their demands. Um, you know, the, over the last five years, there has been already two peace processes. We had one in January 2020, the, the Berlin process. Um, but if we go back five years further, uh, we can go back to Morocco and Algeria, this Khirad process that brought into existence this question of the presidential elections. Um, and it's really important to understand what presidential elections are. Presidential elections are not the way that we should understand them in a European or Western context. This is not about, you know, the most charming candidate. It's not about, um, you know, it's not about the vanity of wanting to be, you know, have your name in history. This is, it's not Libya's mirror, mirror on the wall moment. This is a really important question because, you know, you have to look at the fine print to understand what the uh, presidency means in Libya. The presidency is the most powerful position in the country because the presidency is the supreme commander of the armed forces. Um, that's not just a, a symbolic position, that's a position that will essentially define the political character of Libya um, and its future. And so I think when it comes down to that, that's a better way of describing what Libyans are electing. They're not electing you know, the most charming, it's not a vanity contest. This is about, you know, about power and the way that power is wielded. Um, and I think to understand that and to reiterate why that's so important, because it goes back to the source of this conflict and why we've had this over the last several years, 
in December 2015, there was um, the, the culmination of this UN Sahrad process, culminated with a government of national accord, uh, led by uh, Fayez Sarraj from Tripoli, uh, uh, and essentially someone that has no, it was equidistant from all the other parties, with eight deputy presidents, eight. So it was a nine-man presidency. Um, and the numbers themselves were confusing, but you know the, the UN's logic at the time was bring everyone into the tent, make everyone feel included, and that inclusion will lead to compromise and cooperation. Um, now, the fine print of that agreement um, was in the Libyan political agreement, the LPA that was drafted by the UN in 2015. And Article 8 of the Libyan political agreement was that the presidential council as a whole is the supreme commander of the armed forces. Now, we can define Libya's conflict in a number of ways. We can say it's been regional between these three different ancient regions of Libya, Cyrenaica, Tripolitania, and Fazan, east, west, and south. We could even claim that it's got, you know, it's about secularists and Islamists, um, which a lot of the time you find uh, commentary sort of tries to oversimplify and then dichotomize these conflicts in terms of their ideological character. I would say that there are aspects of all of those things that might be true, but very, very little of it can give you an understanding of what the actors themselves want. Now, what the actors themselves want, they ask for in negotiations. That's a better measure for me as to what the conflict is about. You can claim it's about this greed, it's about that grievance, it's about all these different things, but unless they're requested in the negotiations, then it's just hot air, as far as I'm concerned. Now, in the negotiations that took place following 2015, we had three rounds of negotiations that were literally bilateral and sanctioned by the UN. The stamp of approval was given to, first, the conference in Abu Dhabi, secondly, a conference in Paris, and then thirdly, a conference in, in, in Palermo. Uh, throughout all of those conferences, the stated ambition was to reconfigure the presidential council, to include Khalifa Haftar at the helm, or to include his ally, political ally, chief political ally, the designer, the architect of the Libyan National Armed Forces, Khalifa Haftar's self-styled army in the east of the country, Agil Saleh, the chief speaker of the parliament. Now, there are two things that are really important to understand about this because they're relevant to today's sequence, today's major kind of kafafal over the sequence of elections and what these elections are about. The first is that, Aguila Saleh, since 2015, has been himself the declared supreme commander of the armed forces. He appointed Khalifa Haftar after he was wanted uh, for an attempted coup in February and May of 2014, two attempted coups to overthrow Libya's first elected government. Now, irrespective of all those things, he holds that position. He has held that position because he rejected the Libyan political agreement even after they appointed a candidate. And the second aspect, which is really important, is that even after we brought into this new government that you mentioned, Khalid, in March of this year, the HOR voted, the parliament allowed for the existence and the creation of a new government and a new presidency at that. Um, but it did not issue a constitutional amendment. And so therefore, in its own rules, Aguila Saleh, the chief political ally of Khalifa Haftar, remains the supreme commander of the armed forces. Now, again, that's small print, but it's five years of small print, or rather six years now of small print, and unless we kind of watch those things closely, it kind of makes sense as to why we're moving towards presidential elections, because it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to the logic. I haven't heard Libyans for years claiming that they want presidential elections. Many Libyans themselves want elections, but that comes to the second point about the conditions for these elections. And as I said earlier on, it's not just the timing of these conditions. You know, it's, it's curious because you can sit on one aisle of this discussion and say, yes, you know, uh, Libyans want elections or they don't want elections. And I think that's an unfair way of characterizing or dichotomizing this. I think Libyans want, why are we asking for elections in the first place? It's a good question to keep asking why. Libyans are asking for elections or Libyans are supposed to have elections to fulfill their democratic rights and to enable the transition uh, of Libya from this peculiar not war, not peace scenario that we were facing for the last year since the Berlin process, but to also have a democratic government and a government that you can hold to account. So let's go through the conditions and, and measure them against that aspect of success. Well, the first condition is that we don't have an electoral law that was passed legitimately. We have an electoral law that was passed by decree, by promulgation, or for those that are laymen, probably passed by fax or by some other ancient tool that is at the disposal of the, of the measures from the web, maybe as uh, House of Representatives of Parliament. It was certainly not passed in the legitimate way or the legal way that it was supposed to do by Libya's own parliamentarians. Now that's not just fine tuning or nitpicking at certain points. The reason why that was the case is that the, the election law itself was designed to cater for certain individuals, including Khalifa Haftar, 
Um, and there's an aspect about that. Now, these are not just moral considerations about whether or not those people should be involved or included in elections. If they're popular, they should stand. If they're not popular, they shouldn't stand. There is a serious issue with that. And that comes to the second point, the security conditions. That's not just about conflict and about war, which we've seen a ton of over the last several years. And in fact, over the last several months since the signing of the ceasefire agreement in October 2020, that ceasefire agreement has got holes punched all the way through it. If you're only looking at one segment of Libya's uh, territory in central Libya in the city of Sirt, where there are Russian mercenaries, where there are Sudanese mercenaries deployed uh, uh, by, by United Arab Emirates, and where there are Turkish Syrian mercenaries that were deployed by the Turkish uh, uh, military themselves, there seems to be no fighting there. There's a lot of movement, but in the south of the country and in the west of the country, there has been countless violations of that ceasefire. And at best today, we can just say that it's got holes punched through it. But the more important aspect about security is the conditions for the ballot box. You have a major, major conflict of interest when one of the actors on the ballot is responsible for securing the ballots in both East and South Libya. And that could be one of the reasons why we've seen you know, a deployment and mobilization of those forces in the South of the country over the last several months in order to capture terrain from rival political actors, rival military actors. We've seen a buildup as of the last several hours, there are now war planes flying over the Southern city of Sabha. But the conditions are more important than that. The conditions are that one candidate on the ballot, Saif al-Islam al-Gaddafi, has gone forward and tried to wage an appeal in the last several weeks. And he, he and the court, well, his lawyer uh, who tried to lodge the appeal um, was faced with resistance from armed groups. The court judges themselves were assaulted and thrown out of the courts by members of the Libyan National Army or the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, Khalifa Haftar's forces. We saw days later in the east of the country, another candidate, Ismail al who visited a football club in the city of Darna and was assaulted in a police car. I mean, that in itself tells you, you know, that the level of security is, is quite strange. I think, again, we come to this dichotomy of Libyans want elections, and if we don't have them, then there's going to be violence. And if we do have them, there's going to be violence. I mean, in the former, if we don't have them and there's violence, isn't that a bit more like a hostage situation? Because at the moment, it seems like, you know, all the conditions on the ground seem to lend themselves to the security actors have a very clear idea about who is going to win those votes. And the perception seems to be that they're going to interfere with the, with the process on the ground. Now that process in itself is what I meant about this conflict of interests. But if we go back to the, uh, uh, the, the prospects, the prospects for a democratic transition, this is where the conditions themselves to me sound insane. And I do have, of course, I have a position on this and I can be as balanced as anyone wants, but I think it's quite clear that just the mor morally equivocate between these two arguments to have or to not have, to be or not to be, is a waste of time. I think it's really clear about what the conditions mean on the ground. And, and for all those asking for elections early or to have them delayed by a week or to have them delayed by a month, or you know, don't count them by days or decades. That's not the substance of the argument. And we know today in circles that are discussing this behind the scenes that we're most likely looking at a February 10th date for elections. And people will murr and say, that's not long enough and that's too short or that's too, uh, or that's too short of a time. The question really is not about how many seconds go by in the time between elections. The question is, what are you doing on the ground to alleviate these conditions and ensure for a democratic transition? Now, the first aspects are not just these electoral laws that were passed by promulgation. The real aspect here that is fundamental to understanding is that there is no constitutional basis for this country. A country that has a tradition, the strongest tradition, I would argue, in the Middle East and North Africa for a strong men holding on to power literally forever. And, and the second aspect about that, without any kind of constitutional restraints in a country where you're electing the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, it clearly indicates why two of the main three candidates are looking to stand, Sir al Islam al-Gaddafi and Khalifa Haftar, because they both see themselves as having a vision of what the military and the socio-political foundations of the state will look like. And they would have ample time and ample resources and no constitutional, legal or political restraints in order to do so. So I think that's an aspect that seems to be irking many people. And that could be a grievance that is leveled by certain actors who have greed. Libya is not in short supply of political status quo actors that want to hold on to their positions. But to dismiss the idea that, oh, constitutions are just, just fine print, it's just a, a nitpicking issue, is to underestimate the legacy of authoritarianism in Libya and the palpable threat and the perception of many of the actors today, many of whom have been meeting with the UN over the last 24 hours and 48 hours, 
and though themselves do not hold positions of state, not status quo, actors, they're civil society actors, activists, people that have fought, people that probably will fight eventually. And they're saying in very clear terms, Libya cannot have an election without a constitution. And then again, the third aspect, and I think this is the most important as I see it, is that what happens on December 25th, let's say if we have those elections, what does the state look like in Libya? You know, sometimes it can be so myopic to talk about elections and you can't see past your own shoelaces. Look further back. Don't go too back. Don't go so far back. Just till January 2020, there was a very easy and very simple plan outlined by the UN in Berlin. It took all of the international actors that were violating the arms embargo, said to them quietly, please stop doing that. They chose not to. But most importantly, it put a plan on the table, a ceasefire, and then unifying Libya's rival institutions, politically, militarily, and economically, and then have elections. Now that has been completely resequenced, most likely because we set a date, the 24th of December, and then all of the actors that were supposed to unify these institutions um, just decided to hold off and just to count the days down to either make sure that the elections couldn't be uh, uh, meaningfully called for in a way, to make sure the constitution was never put firmly on the table in any other way other than at the Libyan political dialogue forum. And most importantly, so they could control territory where the ballots will be cast. Now, I'm not asking for unification because I want peace and love. That's not my, that's not the main basis of my argument here. It's not a moral argument. It's an argument of subservience. If you elect a leader or a head of the state, then surely you must have a state. And right now, these rival military factions, particularly at the military level, are in absolutely no status or in absolutely no position to be unified. And it comes back to the original question, which I was saying earlier on. This is about the political character of the state. And these two rival factions have irreconcilable visions of the state, both at the lower level and at the senior level. They either have a military that will be subservient or a military that won't. And it seems like to me the tensions on the ground, the inability to unify those, unify those factions seems to be a question as to why we've had this whole conflict over the last several years, at least the last six or seven years. Now I'll leave it with some parting thoughts because I don't wanna go on too much longer. My parting thoughts are just ask yourself sanely speaking, what happens the day after elections? Because it seems to me that at least one of the actors in particular, and I don't wanna make him my favorite actor, but he is the one that has been around in Libya for over 52 years, Khalifa Haftar. This actor in particular has a luxury of offerings in front of him. He can either say, I am Libya's next elected president, whether he stuffs those ballots or not, the perception on the ground is that he's certainly going to do so. And if he loses, then he goes back to the negotiation table and says, we have this Berlin process, I'm not done negotiating yet. So Khalifa Haftar is going to be a figure of Libya's political life. I won't say for another 52 years, because I think COVID might get the better of him, or it may get the better of all of us. And um, in that sense, but he's been around for, you know, for over half a century. Thank and I you, think he's Anna. got ambitions to be around for a little bit longer. Thanks, Khalid. Thank you. I appreciate that. You, you gave us a lot of uh, food for thought here that uh, hopefully will enrich our uh, Q&A uh, session. Uh, Hanan, the microphone is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I have the unkind task of speaking after, after Anas, which is always, <laughs> always difficult. I don't think I have the same charm uh, or fluency, but let's give it a shot. Thank you so much to the Arab Center for hosting us. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here uh, together with the amazing co-panelists. Um, I think Anas has very aptly described where things are at uh, today, and I will not repeat. I will do my best to stay within uh, the allotted uh, time. I think the one consensus that is absolutely there uh, is that national elections are badly needed uh, to get Libya past this transition, which you know has been quite violent, uh, to, to say the least. There is no question that democratic nation building is, is key, uh, but I would say our concern at this point is not whether elections take place on December 24th, which after all is a random date uh, that was picked. Our concern is that the lack of rule of law, justice and accountability uh, mean that no free and fair elections are possible in the current climate. I would not caveat or try to hedge the statement. I would just say that no free and fair elections are possible at this time in Libya. Um, uh, I would also say that free, fair, inclusive and transparent elections something became something like the rallying cry of all countries involved in Libya, and there's many, 
um, including, including the UN, uh, but has anyone really bothered to look at what's behind those words and how this squares with the current uh, human rights conditions in Libya that remain still very precarious? The country is reeling from internal displacement. Uh, thousands are held in long-term arbitrary uh, detention. Likely, they will not get the chance to vote, even though there would be no legal impediment for them not to do so. The last conflict in Tripoli has resulted in civilian casualties, in unlawful killings, destruction of structures, including hospitals and schools. Uh, there are still unexploded ordinances. Uh, such as uh, landmines that prevent people from returning to their homes, and hundreds of people uh, remain missing, including many civilians. The grim discovery of uh, the mass graves in Tarhuna and the hundreds that are missing just from that town alone, I think is very emblematic of the massive issues that still remain to be, res uh, that still remain to be resolved. Um, and, uh, and impunity is raging in the country, which means that all of these acts since 2011, not just since the last conflict, um, have been carried out with absolute impunity. There's currently committing a crime comes at absolutely no cost to the individual or to the armed group or militia that that person, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is uh, linked with. I think the other issue is that political expediency um, and from what, you know, um, I've been seeing over the span of these very uh, long discussions at, at the end, these very long political discussions, has been a hallmark also of this transition. Uh, we've seen UN Security Council members, including the United States, uh, the UN mission, and the many other actors who are involved in Libya. Uh, they've pushed for elections on December 24th with the same expediency that they pushed through a new government, uh, and the same expediency that they readily accepted a disputed elections law without respecting commitments to ensure consensus among the different constituencies and all the other legal issues that Anas has already uh, so aptly described that I will not repeat. But we have also seen that this, the same expediency or the same policy of appeasement uh, that has been practiced over the years, uh, in plain terms, it means that justice cannot be delivered to victims of serious violations. Um, and, and that is, it's simply not a priority. Um, so I think, you know, the big question obviously to ask, is it elections for the sake of elections or is this really about democratic uh, nation building? The rationale that comes most of the time in these discussions is that for any big change to happen, elections must happen at any cost because Libya needs a president who has a mandate um, that extends to more than a mandate that can be given from the Libya Political Dialogue uh, Forum and the UN mission. I have heard an, this idea quite often. I have heard that an elected president will ensure that all the human rights woos are dealt with at some point, as if an elected president you know, has a magic wand that other actors don't, don't have. Um, there's also this idea that elections will ensure that somehow foreign fighters uh, who are present in Libya in big numbers um, will depart um, and that and also that this president will unify armed groups into one national army. I think that this is all wishful thinking and I think it's uh, worth to take a step back and to look at some of these preoccupations. I want to go through them relatively swiftly and then give some uh, some closing uh, remarks. Um, first, I think it's it's key that the environment needs to be conducive to hold free and fair elections, meaning it would be, it should be free of coercion, discrimination, intimidation of voters, candidates, political parties, anyone who's involved in elections. Uh, elections rules should not arbitrarily exclude any potential voters or candidates and authorities need to ensure that the vote is inclusive, meaning that everybody has a best shot, all the different constituencies, be it internally displaced people, be it Libyans, Libyan expatriates who live outside of Libya, other marginalized communities in remote areas, that they really get their best shot uh, at being able to vote in these elections. Uh, this also includes people with uh, disabilities. Um, authorities also need to ensure that freedom of speech and association are granted. Currently, you know, currently journalists, bloggers, activists, um, are in, very, in a very difficult position and I would say are under still 
a lot of pressure. Uh, they're at risk of intimidation, harassment, and attacks, and very often resort to self-censorship. I wouldn't consider that the current media landscape in Libya um, is free. There's also, of course, legal um, impediments and draconian laws that prevent civic groups from operating uh, freely. Uh, and that is a, a very big issue when it comes to preparing the ground for elections, especially since, you know, I'm also looking at the calendar, it's a few days to go, a week, a week to go, um, and obviously campaigning hasn't started and campaigning can't happen uh, overnight. Um, candidates also need to be able to move around the country. Um, in fact, when you look at the list of candidates, uh, some of them have already been uh, mentioned. They couldn't even they couldn't even set foot in one part of the country that is hostile uh, to them. They're not even able to submit appeals um, in areas because uh, in areas um, certain areas because of a flawed elections law that mandates appeals only to be submitted in the same region where the candidate. Um, where a specific uh, candidate um, has submitted their, their candidacy. Um, we have already documented elections related violence. Um, Anna's mentioned uh, some of them. There have been physical attacks, but there have also been uh, serious threats uh, that were, uh, uh, that were uh, relayed to, to candidates, uh, for example. Um, in addition to the closure uh, in the area in Sabha during uh, some of the appeals process, for example, by armed groups, the closure of roads um, and so on. So we've already been documenting some elections related uh, violence. Um, the last big theme I think is the judiciary and is the state of the institution currently um, and whether or not they're able to deal promptly and fairly with elections related disputes, particularly when it comes to uh, candidacies, but also voting, uh, of course. Um, if you look at the immense pressure that judges, prosecutors, and lawyers are subjected to uh, by armed groups, if you look at the major um, uh, issues that are currently within the judiciary um, and attempts, for example, to control uh, who controls the Supreme Judicial Council, which is the highest judicial authority um, in, in the country, uh, with erratic, when we've seen erratic decisions on a near daily basis of who is actually the chairman, uh, who is responsible, who is um, a, a member. If you consider that currently there's no operational constitutional court or constitutional chamber that would scrutinize legislation that is deemed that it deems unconstitutional, uh, no constitutional court to provide uh, a very important safeguard against executive uh, overreach, a court of last resort. As Anna's put it, there's no constitutional restraint. That is a very, very uh, serious issue. And if you look at the current example of how weak institutions are, how difficult it is to deal with this, uh, with this appeals process because it is frankly all over the place um, given given you know the lack of this uh, very important checks um, and balances and that may very well prove to be the Achilles heel of these uh, planned elections. As a result, I would say of all of this, um, it is only possible to deduct that free and fair elections are simply not possible. Um, and further, um, the prospects for alleviating the human rights conditions, those remain quite dim. Um, I would like to end with some recommendations before um, handing it uh, over, just a couple of minutes. Um, my, uh, my first point would be before rushing, my first policy recommendation would be before, first, before rushing to hold elections at any cost, the United Nations mission um, and some of the Security Council members that are very active in Libya, including the United States and Russia and others, of course, uh, should urge and support authorities to create conditions that are conducive to a free and fair vote as a first step. As a very basic requirement, Libyan authorities need to make sure that the environment is free of coercion, discrimination, and intimidation of voters and candidates. That's simply not the case. The judiciary should be supported to be able to deal promptly and fairly with the elections related disputes um, that, I, that, I, that I mentioned. On elections, the government also needs to ensure that the security plan for polling places will hold up, um, that there is a robust security plan, that the highest number of eligible voters can vote, including, including all the marginalized groups uh, that I mentioned, 
that independent monitors have access to polling stations, even remote, even, even ones that are in remote uh, areas, and that the voter registry undergoes an independent external audit. We have not seen this happen in some time. Um, the government should also, as a step, as a very, very important step, um, scrap a decree that prevents civic groups from operating without overcoming massive and unreasonable hurdles. There is currently a decree in place that makes it almost virtually impossible for many small-sized NGOs to operate. Um, uh, and that prevents their active participation, obviously, in these elections. And we, re we urge the government uh, or the presidency council uh, to revoke this uh, decree uh, as a matter of, uh, of, of, of urgency. Um, I think on everything else, really, of all the other issues, uh, that I have mentioned, there needs to be, I think, one, there needs to be a consensus that accountability is key um, and that support for institutions uh, that can give accountability, such as uh, the International Criminal Court that has a mandate in Libya, um, local judiciary, the local courts, uh, the local criminal justice system, um, and uh, the UN mandated Libya fact funding mission, that they get all the support uh, that they need um, in order to ensure that accountability um is not thrown out uh, the window um thank you very much i'm very happy to answer any questions that come up thank you Hanan, particularly for that uh, list of recommendations uh, that hopefully would lead to, to some uh, more uh, discussion during the q a uh, session uh, zahra the microphone is yours please Yes, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you uh, for uh, the co-panelists who laid uh, the foundation for my intervention. Uh, I'd just like to highlight that I am participating here with my two hats. One as, yes, a woman's activist and a member of the Libyan political uh, forum, which is track one of peace negotiations. I've been participating in the peace negotiations since 2013. So uh, I can testify for how it has been going uh, throughout the last uh, decade or like eight years. And uh, actually to answer your question, whether this is rushing uh, to elections or not, I would start with uh, uh, the fact at least from my opinion, that the elections are overdue. Long ago. And uh, since 2013, we had, when Tarek Mitri was uh, mediating or leading or facilitating, because each time it's facilitating or mediating that uh, uh, political track, it was about a roadmap. Many, many Libyans and even experts are not aware of the discussions we had ever since. So it's the same uh, as Dr. Ahmed Jahani would call it roundabouts. And this is the case since ever uh, the failure of uh, Libya's transition uh, were after the first elections we had in 2012 and were not addressing the root causes the, that we had, which is uh, uh, DDR, the SSR, the, um, the economic grievances. Uh, uh, when we had our first um, uh, political track during Parak Mitri, what was on the table discussed is only the relationship between uh, the executive and the legislative body. Back then it was the GNC and the government, uh, the temporary or the transitional government uh, led by um, Sayyid Ali Zaydan. Back then there were, um, there were certain groups in Cyrenaica blocking the oil fields. Uh, there were uh, groups, um, armed groups uh, from the Amazigh uh, uh, calling for uh, blocking the oil fields, uh, calling for uh, boycotting the election, uh, the the uh, the the elections of the Constitutional Assembly because they were against the electoral law of the Constitutional Assembly, which we were uh, pushed 
to have a referendum on. And that's how it all started. So the problem had to do with Article 30 in the Constitutional Declaration tying Libya's uh, legislative body, which was then also um, uh, an executive body. So it's, it's an executive and a legislative body with, uh, and tying its mandate uh, with the referendum. This is how it all started. And this is why we had the first round of political talks during Barak Nikt. So let's remind ourselves of how things started. And this is how the first protest started, La uh, against the GNC. They said, your mandate is over whether the, uh, the, the, the constitution is ready or not, we have to go to election. The same forces of, now we call them political dinosaurs as Stephanie Williams uh, called them, or uh, the, uh, the, the forces of the status quo said, no, we, still, uh, we should be in power until we go to a referendum. Okay, back then in 2014, there were uh, there was um, uh, 2014. We we only had the elect uh, the the elections, so it was just established. And we all know that 2014, 2015, it's where uh, the civil war broke in Libya and where the security situation uh, deteriorated, and how this uh, constitutional assembly was never able to have like civic engagement. There were uh, it itself, it suffered from political polarization and divideness in itself, okay? And so we went to the elections that year where Salwa Bugagis was killed and where uh, the, the launching of Karama movement and the Fajr, uh, Fajr Libya it happened later on when they refused the elections. So let's be aware of what happened, how things, because it's all roundabouts. And when we first had the, 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 the first roadmap, it was called back then by, because I was a member of the drafting committee as I was uh, in the last political dialogue, a, mem a member of the legal committee and the drafting committee of the constitutional basis, which I am an eyewitness of how the forces of the status quo, they all with different backgrounds agreed to disagree, to abort the track of the constitutional basis, basically to defraud Libyans of the right to choose whom they want. What we see in Libya today, because some of us are afraid of going back to tyranny of uh, of uh, uh, tyranny and dictatorship of one leader, what we are facing today is the tyranny of the minority. What we see today is the state capture by the oligarchs. They are the ones who want to defraud Libyans of their right to choose whoever they want. The problem is, is this polarization. Elections or no elections, it should be definitely elections. It's overdue elections. Let's work on how are we going to mitigate the challenges. And since we're talking uh, uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the day 24th, let's be clear that last year, it was last year. We are the ones who drafted the roadmap, set the date. It was more than a year for the, the elections. They should have been ready with the, constitutional, uh, with the constitutional basis. And by the way, all, and I'm telling you, I am a member of the drafting committee in uh, 2013. I was a member of the political track in 2015 with Lyon in the, uh, the track of political leaders. And we're still talking about the same constitutional declaration. It's the same thing. It's not something new. It's the same mandate given to the president. There's nothing new about it. And I am testifying and uh, as an insider and I'm telling you, these are the questions that were on the table between the political forces. 
they did not and do not want Libyans to choose the, uh, directly the president. They actually, they would have been okay and would have not aborted the, uh, the, the, the constitutional basis, which they're now saying there is no constitutional basis. They are the ones who said no to the constitutional basis because simply they want non-direct elections, election for the president. They want a parliamentary system. They want a system, the same system in Lebanon. Let's be frank and clear about it. This is the tyranny of the minority. Yes, definitely we have. And according to the constitutional declaration, uh, uh, to the, the constitutional rule that we drafted, and by the way, we had over the year 28 sessions of the legal committee of the Libyan uh, of the Libyan political dialogue working on the constitutional the constitutional basis we had more than 40 sessions of drafters working on the uh, the same constitution before that we had three sessions one in Buznega, one in Cairo one in Hergada uh, led by the UN mission uh, f uh, facilitating the talks between the HOR and the High State Council on the constitutional basis for the elections. Before that, they had like several rounds with Ghassan Salama to agree on the constitutional basis to go to elections. During that time, Libyans went to war, lives were lost, uh, 20,000 mercenaries arrived to Libya. Uh, 10 or 20 military, uh, foreign military bases are established in Libya. How much time are we going to lose? And it's this uh, uh, old story that academics enjoy. Is it state building before or uh, democ democracy before? Well, if we open books, they, they, they will say it's, it's still a dilemma. There's Nicaragua, where when they had a, a state before the democracy or elections, and there's a bad example, Bosnia having elections uh, before democracy. So the whole idea of uh, Berlin process was basically there was a unity of purpose that after silencing the guns, we are supposed to have ABC in any stabilization, uh, a, a, a peace building tool is elections. And it's long overdue. The last elections we had was in 2014. We had a power sharing model since 2015 that has failed miserably, okay? And we have to, we confront ourselves about this power sharing using the uh, elusive terms of uh, inclusivity, of consensus. It's only about consensus. It does not represent the woman I represent. It does not represent uh, 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 people on the ground. People we've seen, Libyans have registered 2.4 2. Um, uh, million people registered for 2.5 million people registered, 2.4 million picked up their cards. How many, uh, we have 5,000 5, uh, um, parliamentary uh, candidates. We have uh, uh, 97 now, 90, uh, uh, 73 presidential candidates. So it's clear that from it's the standpoint a of Libyans, they want elections. We have our concerns. Some are very legitimate, but let the, uh, let's break them down because not having the elections, and I'm telling you all, will, will be worse than where we started. Now we have this process, Berlin process, and what's good about Berlin's process is different than the Sakhairat Agreement, that it acknowledged that Libya's problem is not only political. It does not need 
only a political solution versus a military solution. This was the problem ever since. And I always say Libya needs a nation building process parallel to the uh, state building process. And the economic, this is where everything can be answered. We need a national charter for Libyans. So they can buy in into the elections fully. Uh, and this is more important than the constitutional basis because the constitutional basis, and I'm telling you, uh, we already have our constitutional basis ready. Uh, and they are the ones who aborted it. It's the same thing about the, the mandate of the president and the parliament. Nothing new. It's the same from the uh, declaration, uh, uh, constitutional declaration. But we definitely need a national charter. We need to link the three tracks, the economic, political, and military tracks. We end to stop. We need to stop the siloing. Because when Ghassan Salama designed this process, there was supposed to be uh, tr three tracks. And whenever we had a stalemate, the military track was advancing and that's good. And we, we need to build on that. Now we have the economic, I don't know why it was paused and actually it was even hijacked by the international group. Uh, so it's not Libyan led anymore. And I think part of the pro uh, problems that are related, and we know that the whole issue is about the, the, the governor of the central bank. They have been stopped uh, uh, basically maintaining the status quo for uh, so as the governor of the central bank remains where he is. So he funds the militias. And so this roundabout remains. There will be no ending of impunity if we don't go back to Libyan people. I, I think I've got a lot of time, but I have recommendations with I, which I can share later because it's very complicated. Um, uh, there, uh, there should be no role for this uh, presidential council, nor government, interim government unity after the 24th of December. And, and let's be clear about it. The, the decision has been made. There will be pause, pause the elections, uh, the, ex uh, the electoral process has already started. I hope by next week or very soon, there will be announcement of the list of candidates because we cannot lose this momentum that we have created. Or otherwise, Libyans, Libyan people who I care about will lose the trust in any process that is led by the international community. Thank you, Zahra, for your excellent presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, uh, Tim Ethan, the microphone is yours. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Khalil, and thank you to the other panelists. Well, I think we've just heard um, a really long list of, of issues and alternate ways of approaching them. So I think everybody has a point as well. Clearly, these elections are overdue. Everybody accepts that those in positions of political power have a very limited mandate, if any mandate at all, left with the people. Yet at the same time, the conditions aren't in place for free and fair elections. There's a conundrum with what to do with some of the, um, the candidates, whether that's Hafta or others, in that what happens you know, if he loses, nothing in his previous behavior suggests that he'll just walk away. So it's a very difficult situation to be in. Uh, so what perhaps I'll do in my short time is try and run through a couple of different scenarios and, and weigh a, a couple of the trade-offs of them, and then hopefully just try and suggest sort of my view on perhaps the best way of squaring this circle so that one gets off the roundabout, but without surrendering uh, the whole house to one political actor over another. And um, so broadly, I think there are, there are three options from here. The first is to have a very short delay, as short a delay as possible, and just push this over the line. The second is to have a slightly longer term delay to look at some of the issues around, for example, the passing of the um, legislation and the HOR, which doesn't meet any of the HOR's own standards, and the issues, um, legitimate issues that people have over the framing and legal framework of the elections that will clearly take a little time 
But in this scenario, say you keep the existing interim government in place. I think the third scenario is that um, you accept that actually the interim government has become part of the problem. It's clearly utilizing state funds to um, help to sculpt the outcome of the elections and that needs to stop. So you need a new interim um, government. But I think at that point, so complicated have these government formation processes been and so unfavorable are all of the, the options for choosing a new one uh, quick, quickly that you're likely to have a longer delay to that process and probably um, more than cosmetic changes. And um, so just to start off with the first, it seems to me that a very, very short delay in pushing ahead um, only really guarantees a hotly contested result. Um, and currently in the current parameters, there's nothing in place really to hold a new government accountable to anything or to what it should do. So the issue there is that it continues to be viewed as a zero sum game and that whoever wins won't actually be able to implement a zero sum result because somebody wins in the West with Baber or someone else, realistically, are they going to be able to uh, wield power or authority in other parts of the country? That's highly questionable. Um, so I think that doesn't really seem to move us much further than where we are. I think personally, it's either option two or three. I think there has to be a greater degree of consensus around the rules and the electoral process. I take on board what Zahra is saying about um, clearly actors engaged in this process willfully looking to derail it. Some of their um, positions may be legitimate, others may be hotly self-interested in preventing anything from arising which may push them out of power. But at the same time, I don't think that you're going to be able to get uh, a unified government to achieve that much unless there is a greater degree of consensus in that process. And here I feel very strongly that the UN has dropped the ball in this last year. It accepted those laws from the House of Rep or Aguila really without the House of Sen Representatives um, agreement to those laws. And it just pressed ahead almost mindlessly, not pressing any real realistic pressure and leaving the high uh, national uh, electoral commission to kind of fix these problems, which obviously that kind of body isn't able to do. And similarly, issues about who can run, we also see right now that each of the candidates is able to wield a court ruling in their own favor. And there's no mechanism of actually uh, determining who's right or wrong in that. We're kind of getting a lowest common denominator um, response. So in that environment, I think, you know, a middling delay to fix at least the most egregious elements of that could be pushed. And that's something that Stephanie Williams could look to agree, maybe when people are talking about a three month delay or something like this, maybe that's a realistic timeline for that. And um, maybe you'll see a greater willingness to rejig this slightly more meaningfully with parliamentary elections, given that some of the main protagonists now won't see the same opportunity of victory in a presidential race. The a third, I think, um, really, I think we have to accept that the current government is part of the problem. It's notable that whilst it's supposed to be a power sharing government, actually, it's got a lot of different power centers included in it, whether through ministerial positions, vice ministerial positions, appointments to state enterprises. But actually, it's quite hotly centralized among a limited family of the Baber clan itself. And the spending that's coming out is off book. It's not related to a budget. It's significant. And it's shaping dynamics on the ground, pro-government pro stability, but also for those who don't um, benefit from that, it's, it's really antagonistic. So I think there's a real question about proceeding with this situation as it currently stands, particularly if we're likely to be in this situation for some time. So if we're delaying a week or two or maybe a month, then maybe that doesn't shift the dial so much. But we know from the past that these processes are often slow and we might see a delay stacked on top of one another. So that I think raises the question about replacing the interim government. And I think that that might be something that's addressed. And at the same time, I think that there's gonna to have to be some reconsideration of the international approach here. Um, so let me just lay out why I think um, th that's the most opportune way to go and some perhaps ways of, of doing that. 
Because for me, the most important question is not that elections take place. For me, it's that the Libyan people have a say in how they're governed and who does it. And the problem with elections as they currently stand is that there's nothing in place for determining what that government will do once it wins or what that set of individuals will do once it wins. There's no framework or parameters for the international community to work with that government. There's no program. There are no manifestos really on offer here. Uh, this is largely a portrayal of individuals or groups over one another. So I think in recognizing where we are right now, there needs to be some connection between an electoral process and what comes after it. Previously, uh, Zahra has mentioned the very painful discussions over the constitution. Clearly there was a revised attempt to try and go through a national conference, which was sunk by Hafter's attack on Tripoli. And I think the LPDF is a kind of trimmed down version of the um, national conference, if you like, to get some kind of Libyan buy-in. So actually, I think what's needed then, something like the charter or a covenant, as, as Zahra mentioned, what could be developed? Could it be, for example, that there are several points of consensus on how the country should be reformed economically, upon which all uh, candidates could agree? Some parameters, obvious ones around accepting the result, agreeing at um, ways, of, ways of working that could be, I think, socialized among the Libyan people because from my discussions and my trip in the last couple of weeks, there is quite a degree of consensus over those issues. It gets divisive when you get to the people. So I think that you need a way of, of determining that whoever comes into power is accountable to something to the internationals, but also to the Libyan people. It can't just be the international side of it that, um, that curries favor. And I think that way might be something like a social contract or constitutional light to give a bridge so that you can move out of this, this, um, this long um, overdue spell where there aren't elections, you have the same people, the same dinosaurs, uh, you know, looking to reinvigorate themselves and to a period where you actually get a government which looks to address the drivers of the conflict. Because nowhere in this political process are any of the drivers of the conflict actually being met. The assumption is that the new government magically does that. And as Zahra has noted, you know, that's the idea that you just get a power sharing government and that creates a moment for reform hasn't played out in places like Lebanon, hasn't played out in places like Iraq. So clearly you need a broader political process, in my view, to be able to enable that kind of um, process to unfold, given that the circumstances on the ground are just so you know, imperfect might be a nice way of putting it, um, so that you have some work, kind of framework to operate towards. And so in that sense, I would hope that that should be the approach rather than just getting this over the line we need to have a structure in place for what happens next as well, so that you know, equally some of the political players and the communities won't interpret the result as so zero sum and that they'll have a part to play in whatever comes next. Thank you, uh, Tim, very much. Uh, thanks to all uh, four of you for your excellent presentations. You've raised some really uh, solid points that need to be addressed if we are to really uh, understand uh, the impact, if you will, uh, of, uh, of these elections, should they uh, proceed on December 4th, or should they uh, be postponed, particularly as several of you have uh, mentioned, uh, different scenarios uh, postponed uh, for a short period of time, uh, pause, uh, maybe as uh, Zahra said, uh, or a longer uh, delay. And it would be interesting to know what the impact of such delay would be. I do have a couple of emails uh, that are related in a way because the focus uh, of both uh, tends to be on the um, uh, Libyan public opinion. Uh, with regards uh, to the uh, elections. At least two of you uh, mentioned that, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct, uh, I think specifically you said Libyans want elections. But what kind of elections do Libyan uh, want? Uh, what, is, what is the current, in, in, in light of the paralysis that seems to exist right now, 
Uh, is there a different public opinion uh, than the, 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 the long-term one, uh, we want elections? When, when they see the delays, when they see the, the absence of a list, uh, not knowing who the candidates are, seeing the, the vague arrangements security-wise and otherwise, is public opinion today as we speak uh, different uh, than uh, just simply that the Libyans want elections? And that's addressed to all four of you. If you don't mind, take a minute or two each uh, to respond to that. Uh, due to the importance of uh, what the, the people in Libya think. Uh, let's go ahead and start in the same order uh, we did. Anas, would you like to uh, tackle that one? Sure. So, I mean, as I said in the, in the, in the opening, um, there hasn't been a demand for presidential elections in a lot of the movement that I've seen or a socio-political movement that I've seen. It's been clearly a demand uh, by one actor, in particular Khalifa Haftar. Um, and it's certainly about this aspect that we forget or that we neglect in the fine print, which is that the uh, president is the supreme commander of the armed forces. Now, having said that, I think it's really important to also understand that why, why these 2.4 million voters, you know, how did they take their votes or how did they take their ballots and when did they take them? There was a major uptick in taking ballots around the time of the registration of two candidates in particular, Khalifa Haftar and Saif al-Islam al-Gaddafi. Now, the third candidate came in, the, the, the oligarch that everyone has referred to, uh, Ad Dbeiba. I think, again, it's really difficult to know exactly why certain individuals will vote one way or the other. But the polling tells us today that he is, he's probably polling at the highest, followed by Saif al-Islam, uh, and then followed by Haftar somewhere in, in 13% or something like this. But irrespective of all those things, I think the really important question is, are Libyans voting because they really want to see a president? Are they voting in the other way to make sure that one candidate doesn't win? And I think there's also a fear aspect that can also determine why Libyans may want to vote for a certain candidate or against a certain, uh, a certain candidate. Because again, these three candidates in, in all of their aspects, you're looking at one candidate who made his billions under Gaddafi, the other candidate who was the son of Gaddafi, and the third candidate has been stabbing him in the back since 1969. So it sort of still revolves around, around Gaddafi in one form or another. Um, and I think in two of those, uh, of those three characters, in particular, Sepp al-Islam and uh, Khalifa Haftar, they certainly have ambitions to return the country in its, in its socio-political engineering around the military to what we, we're accustomed to under the Jamahiriya. You know, this idea that the military is the tribe and the tribe is the military um, and that divide and conquer. So I think that's a really important aspect because those two candidates bring the prospect, in my view, of more war and not less and not more peace. Um, they're certainly, and we've seen this, we've seen this several times over the last several years. We can look at 2011, 2014, and 2019. I should add that the war started in May of 2014, not after the elections which happened in July, the results came in August, they sat in September. So the sequence of those elections was not a, a response to those things. Libya Dawn and, and Operation Dignity happened all in the space of May of 2014. Now, why? Because again, these are the big political lightning rod moments. You always see scuffles in Libya, that's nothing new. There are always skirmishes between different militias and different armed groups. But when do you find the mobilization or the trigger moments that galvanize tens of thousands of groups on all sides? East, West and South. When do you find those moments? 2011, when the revolution started to try and bring down Muhammad Gaddafi. 2014, when Khalifa Haftar launched an operation, a military operation, and attempted coup twice in three months. In 2019, when he, as, as, as Tim has mentioned, when he torpedoed the national conference and attacked the capital Tripoli. Now, those moments are not just about the fact that there's war, it's what those wars represent. And again, this is what these elections necessarily represent. And I think that's where we can always gaff up and slice up statistics and say, well, Libyans really want elections, but I think they also want free and fair elections. And I think the danger that I think many of us are trying to point at is to not rob them of their right to free and fair elections, not rob them of, their, of fulfilling their democratic rights because they're not interested in dipping their fingers in ink. Many people now are disillusioned with just dipping their fingers in ink and not seeing their lives changed. And the number of things that I think Libyans want to see across the board change, you can just ask the Danish Refugee Council, they describe the circumstances during the pandemic in Tripoli at the end of the war, not the beginning of the war, as near like apocalyptic. And I think when you look at really what's happening, when you can't get water, uh, running water out of your tap, when you can't get functioning electricity, sometimes for minutes, hours, or just partially throughout the day, when you can't get cash out of the vending machines or you can't get it from your bank and your money is not only experiencing inflation, but your wealth is deteriorating and your middle class has been decimated. And you find now Libyans are looking to try and take 
boats to Europe, that tells you that the situation on the ground is not great. And I should, I should also mention one other thing that hasn't been mentioned. Libya is literally and figuratively covered in crime scene tape. And I think we often forget this, right? It's literally and figuratively covered in crime scene tape. And instead of bringing those individuals to account for what they've done, not only in the last two years, or the last seven years, those that stole the money as we see in the, in the, in the capital, those that have stolen the, the money and killed more people in the east of the country and in the south of the country. Instead, we're not bringing them to account, we're rewarding them with a process that Hanan mentioned, this political expedience, by rewarding them not only with elections, but the kind of elections that they want under the kind of conditions that they would accept, not the Libyan people. So we should also be quite clear about the Libyan people. I don't hear anyone, any Libyan person saying, I don't want an election without integrity. I don't want a free and fair, but of course they want them. It's not even an assumption. It's just basic common sense. So I think Libyans want to see a transition in their lives. They want to see a process. And as Tim mentioned as well, this idea of moving forward and advancing their lives. I think that's really, really important. Um, but it isn't just measured in the moments and the hours that they will cast their ballots. It's what happens in the day after. And I think that's where I'm measuring what Libyans truly want from these elections. Anyone else on public opinion? I mean, I'll probably just yeah, um, just add very quickly uh, because Anas, you really put it very aptly and you, you spoke my mind on, on lots of issues. I don't think the question is whether elections should take place or not. I think I was you know, quite clear that uh, the only way forward for Libya is to have elections, but I think it's precisely how these elections are to be uh, conducted. Um, Human Rights Watch takes no position on whether the elections should take place on a specific date, but I think it is incredibly important that people, especially given the heavy legacy um, of Muammar Gaddafi um, and his government, and given the very difficult past uh, decade in Libya, people should really get the very best chance uh, that they can get um, in the best, uh, best faith effort that can be given to them to choose somebody who will represent them um, adequately. And this is certainly, this is currently simply not possible. Now, of course, there can be a choice. I think Tim brilliantly laid out some of the options, some of which I think, you know, sound, sound very reasonable. Um, but, you know, the, 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 there are many options, many scenarios of how things uh, can go. Um, and the question is not whether people should have or should be able to uh, vote. The question is under what circumstances can they vote and can they? And this is not a small thing because otherwise let's throw out the UN charter. Let's throw out everything that talks about democratic nation building. Uh, you know, let's throw out everybody who has ever talked about, you know, elections to be conducted in a free um, and fair way. I don't think that the expectations of Libyans are less I'm not speaking for Libyans, I'm not Libyan my, myself, uh, so I will leave that to everybody else, but I'm just saying that it's extremely important to not come in here uh, with another standard and say Libyans should just be fed this and should be fine with the, the way the situation is and we're going to fix everything after the fact because certain things are very difficult to fix after the fact um, and can cost Libyans another decade, another very bloody uh, decade. So I think this would be just my word of caution when it comes to not using the terms free and fair and transparent uh, elections, um, you know, as sort of a rallying uh, call. Thank you. Zara? Yes, uh, I think I was clear, uh, and the numbers are clear, that definitely Libyans want the elections, and they actually want presidential and parliamentary elections. Let me be clear about this. I might not be personally uh, 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 an advocate for a presidential uh, system in Libya, and uh, that does not mean uh, I think a constitutional monarchy would be best for Libyans, but I, I should not impose on Libyans my own opinion. So, but let us again uh, frame this carefully. This is not about only elections. This is about elections in a country that just got out of an armed conflict, that we only have a seize of fire that is very fragile, okay? And we, it's, it's, it should be framed as the status quo is not uh, sustainable and would actually further divide the country. So it should be, what we should call for is a minimum 
basis for fair elections. And I think the pause was important to deal with the very uh, outstanding sensitive issues regarding the sum of the candidates. And that's why we're actually pausing, we're taking the risk and pausing. And I think uh, the HNEC, uh, which I have been arguing that could be uh, could play the role of the grantor institution, especially if it's supported by Libyans and the international community, even after the hiccup of the appeals uh, that happened lately, because we do have a, a very fragile uh, judiciary. Uh, the, we're dealing with a country that was stateless for four decades. We're dealing with a country with a, a culture of impunity, not for the last 10 years, but for the last 50 years. So it's, it's, it's about making the difficult uh, uh, choices. It's not about making the best elections. This will not be a perfect elections because we need to get rid of this tyranny, this tyranny of the minority that have captured the state is basically uh, now uh, uh, working at the collapse of the state. So we need to resort back to Libyans. And that's what I always call plan A, the reset. And I cannot force my own opinion, which, which is plan B, and I've stated uh, uh, in other places, plan B, it's after the failure of the elections, would be the case of Cambodia. Clearly, the Security Council jumping in and its restitution, the restoration of the constitutional monarchy. But we should give Libyans the chance to choose whomever they want after working hard these couple of or few months in perfecting the electoral process, not aborting it in the name of we as guardians don't think that it's best fit for you at the moment. Uh, Tim, let me ask you uh, regarding your uh, option three, the need for a new government in a way, in light of what we heard from Anas, the dismal failure, of, of the government thus far to even make any inroads in preparing the, the you know, uh, tilling the, the soil, if you will, for fair uh, uh, and free uh, elections. What are the prospects for, you know, getting to that type of government uh, in, in light of what we discussed uh, and the failures that were referred to? Well, look, I think, you know, I'm very realistic about the situation. Um, I, I think, um, just quickly on the, the position of Libyans towards the elections, I think given the, the current the situation that people are living through, power cuts, rising prices, you know, weakening economy, fewer opportunities, everybody would be um, understandable to look for something which could institute meaningful change. Um, the question I would love to see is a poll of what Libyans anticipate will come out of the elections and compare that to the, to the um, to the support for them, because I think in most cases, people are supportive of elections that would help to change the guard, improve things, or also prevent one candidate or another from potentially, you know, um, treating them very, very badly. So the answer really depends on, on the nature of the result. And I think that links to your second question. That's why I think there has to be a kind of social contract connection to what comes with the new government so that, um, you know, actually, the next person can't come in and just furnish contracts among um, a limited elite and use the money of the state to support and build uh, influence. Uh, there has to be a sort of uh, a means of operating. And clearly, we've seen that that requires consensus. I mean, this stuff gets complicated because in some ways, the refusal of the parliament to pass a budget has facilitated the government using off book strategies. But at the same time, the budget that's being put forward was expanded to try and use fund state funding in a certain way. So there's a lack of trust, there's a lack of parameters, there's a lack of accountability being pushed by the internationals. Everybody stated very clearly what was happening at the beginning of this government, and a blind eye was turned. You know, you only have to look also at the nature of the way that this government was selected when legitimate concerns about that selection process are kind of covered up because it was seen as a lesser evil. 
these things matter. These parameters matter. You've got to change the rules of the game. And I think it, for me, in a kind of academic sense, is that systems change, but you've got to have a process which enables that. And I think that's where I struggle with the, the elections as they're currently proposed, because what will happen is a new government will come in and say, okay, well, we're sovereign and we're going to go ahead and do what we want to do. And a large proportion of the Libyan population won't agree with that. It will be contested. And the internationals then have no actual current formulation of how they would deal with that. So this is going to be a long road. And I think you've got to look at this next government as starting to a bit of a foundational moment to change those rules of the game. And ultimately, there needs to be more of a social contract between Libyans and those who govern them. Um, the irony, actually, I think, is that a process that started off as a means of um, cleaning away the political dinosaurs actually has become the principal way through which those political dinosaurs are going to reinvent themselves. So that's another risk. Actually, it's a pretty good chance that if elections go ahead immediately, that you'll get the same cast of characters, albeit in a slightly different configuration. And then really, what have you changed? So um, that's, that's the way I would kind of approach it, starting from where you want to be and working back and seeing where election fits into that, rather than seeing elections as an end in themselves. And whilst the internationals are saying that's what they're doing, actually, because of the constant messaging solely about a date, and basically nothing else, and no real plans for what comes next beyond a, a vague six months in a, in a roadmap, they've really got themselves in a bind. And that's also, you know, the issue about momentum now, what you do, because credibility is an issue. I think we're going to see a series of delays, but it's not worth pushing it over the line when it's not going to get any of the things that you assume it to get, because the internationals are basing it off the assumption that they need a state partner to work with to do all the things that need to be done. But actually, examples in other parts of the world that are post-conflict suggest that that's not the way that it works. Um, it takes a much more of a, of a state, supporting a state building approach. All right, thank you. We have a question from uh, Marianne Lanata uh, from Lund University, Sweden. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentations to all uh, panelists. And her question uh, focuses on the 10% of Berbers and Amazigh in uh, northwestern Libya and their position in, in Libyan society. Are they taking active part uh, quickly in, in the elections? And are they raising uh, their own, highlighting their own Amazigh uh, questions within uh, the campaign? I mean, there is no campaign per se, right? uh in 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 the uh, within the uh, the elections uh uh zahra go ahead as i said uh this election uh is based on the constitutional declaration so uh, again uh, and as i uh, pointed out from the beginning the management of the uh, the the conflict in Libya always focuses on um, um, on a sort of um, an approach that it's basically political versus military, and that's what I think was is part of the problem. Not addressing uh, the conflict from a comprehensive approach. So, um, and especially with the hold on the constitutional, uh, with the referendum, the referendum was a major issue and, that and that's why uh, we're not having elections based on uh, the results of the elections and the constitution project. It's because people like the, the Amazir, the Tuareg, who boycotted the elections. Uh, some are using in their campaigns uh, the, uh, the the interim prime minister, though the campaigns, as you rightly said, have uh, have not started. But he is uh, this is his uh, populist uh, policy of uh, trying to appease all. Has promised um, that schools in areas uh, um, controlled by the or uh, populated by the Amazigh will uh, the Amazigh uh, language will be taught there. So it's used, but the whole whole thing that's why I'm saying what we need in order not to have a roundabout because in the best case scenario if the elections this is successful it will take us back to 2020. This is the best case scenario it's a, an, a roundabout. There could have been another roadmap 
another option, which I have personally, uh, since 2013, I've been proposing that, which is the uh, uh, reinstitution uh, re of constitution uh, uh, 1951, which would address the economic grievances. It's a federal system. And I think that this discussion is still overdue. It's not on the table of negotiations when it comes to the UN. They seem to see, uh, always want to discuss a constitutional basis, how, what, what is the mandate of the president and the parliament, and that's it. So not addressing the real issues. That's why a national charter could be another roundabout to address these issues if they do not, if the international community does not want us, and I say they do not want us at the moment to make a final decision on the constitution. I personally, as a member of the legal committee in the Libyan political dialogue forum, have proposed uh, that we reinstate the constitution of 1951 as an interim constitution without even a constitutional monarch. It could have been a creative way. You have a solid constitutional basis and the, uh, the mandate of the king is, will be given, delegated according to article 52 to the prime minister. So you would have a strong executive head uh, of the executive body. And I think definitely we need a strong head of the executive body to deal with DDR issues, SSR with the mercenaries, with all these issues. So we are not at the moment having a drastic, or we're only we're allowed to have quick fixes. Even now when we're holding the elections, it's only to address the issue of appeals, uh, uh, that's the legal appeals and the, the HNAC. So I think at least, at least we should have the national charter as Tim was saying, and the national charter is not only a, a pact between among uh, the, uh, the 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 um, the candidates, the presidential candidates, to accept the the results, but also to address the real issues, uh, the economic grievances, uh, remodeling, uh, remodeling the economic uh, structure. That's why it's important at this stage to link the three tracks to restructure the political, uh, 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 the political process as a whole and to, because you cannot go back to the LPDF as it is. It was a very flawed process. And no, corruption was normalized in that UN led peace process. So uh, Stephanie Williams needs to come with something new. You cannot address the new issues with the old tools you had and they were actually flawed. So I think, uh, Restructuring yep. it, bringing the economic back at the center, going for the option of the national charter is where we should start. Uh, Anas, uh, we have a question for you from uh, William Gann. If Haftar refuses to accept the results of the elections, should they take place? How will the international community uh, respond? Do you see a situation in Libya then, like Syria, where Haftar controls the East and the UN-backed government uh, controls uh, West Libya indefinitely? Well, I think, as I said it beforehand, I mean, you know, this isn't the first, this isn't Haftar's first rodeo. Um, and I think we just, all we have to do is look at his previous behavior um, <clears throat> to understand what he will say. There are a number of things, I think, on the scenarios on the table here, but the most apt one is that he says, yeah, I know we had elections, but now we're back to the state building. And he will return to the um, military track as set in Berlin and will renegotiate that. We already know, according to Haaretz, um, in the last several weeks that there is a back channel between uh, Abdul Hamid Dabeba and Khalifa Haftar that has been put forward in the United Arab Emirates and by the Israelis. So there is something that has been put together for quite some time. There are you know, meetings that continue. We saw a meeting uh, between the, the chief of staffs on both sides, or I believe the interim chief of staff on the east side and the, and the head, uh, head of the armed forces on the west side um, in certain the last few days about talking of unification. Uh, of the military forces. So we see that there may be something that is being cooked, I guess, different scenarios as the as the ground changes. But to really outline it in a very simple sense, if Khalifa Haftar wins these elections, he will he will dis, he will dismantle the UN and Berlin process because he will decide that his forces are legitimate and that he has an electoral mandate, as was said earlier on, and as all of the parliaments, whether it was the GNC, whether it was the HOR, and whether now uh, with Khalifa Haftar, 
going forward, all of them have used electoral legitimacy in the exact same way. They ram it down your throat and they say that they have legitimacy to kill, to maim, to bomb, to do whatever they want. So without any prejudice here, all of those sides have done that, irrespective of who they're fighting. But really, Khalifa Haftar would give it would give him that mandate if he wins. If he loses again, he goes back to the drawing board and says, "I want to, uh, I want to do that." The third option is, is an even easier one. He just says, "Well, I don't like who you've elected. He's probably the Muslim Brotherhood, or he's a terrorist." And we go back to this roundabout that has been mentioned for several years now. So, you know, th this is where I see kind of the the the, the scenarios moving forward. Uh, let's conclude with a quick uh, answer uh, to this uh, question. Hanan and, and Tim, I'd like to give you a minute or two to respond to Ian uh, Drummond with regards to, uh, again, the, uh, the main obstacle, if you will, uh, standing uh, in the way of free and fair uh, elections. Hasn't the main obstacle been all along the existence of this Li Libyan militias and serving as proxies for outside powers, is, is that destined to continue or, or are we going to see an, an end to that? Hanan, take a minute or two uh, and Tim, let's conclude with your answer to that. Um, thank you for that. I don't, I don't see that um, the presence of, uh, I don't see that this is destined to end anytime soon. Uh, I believe that the uh, interests uh, of those who are currently involved in Libya um, are, are very much or appear to be very much to keep their, not just a toe in the game, but keep their whole foot in and be sure that they are uh, firmly uh, within, within, uh, uh, within reach. I don't see that any of this, um, I, don't, I don't see, to, to rephrase it, I don't see that the obstacles as such, it would be a bit simplistic to say that the obstacles to free and fair elections uh, is the fact that, you know, Libyan militias are being used by proxies. Libyan militias are many of these armed groups that are in existence, the biggest one being the Libyan Arab Armed uh, Forces in Eastern Libya. Yes, it is also an armed group. It's not a state actor, um, are sure kept alive by the support of foreign actors. But it's too simplistic to say that that's it. I mean, there are very much so uh, there are political uh, agendas and aspirations, um, and Anas and others have spoken about Khalifa Haftar and other Khalifa Haftar, mm -hmm. Abdha, uh, uh, Dabeiba, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, who just returned, but there are other uh, actors um, as well um, who, you know, have uh, their own uh, agenda and they have their own uh, political um, asp aspirations. Um, and so the Western support is what, you know, is prolonging this very, very painful situation, I guess, because otherwise maybe things would be resolved uh, more quickly. But to say that it is the main idea uh, or the main reason, um, I, would, I would not necessarily um, agree uh, with, with such a uh, statement. And I would just like to say as a final note um, that really there needs to be both at the level of the Libyan authorities uh, and at the level of uh, the international community, and with that I mean everyone who's involved in Libya, and again it's many, um, that Libyan authorities have responsibilities to ensure uh, whenever these elections take place that they are free of coercion and discrimination and intimidation. This is their job, their responsibility, um, and we really look to them uh, to, to, to be up to that. Um, and at the same time, uh, we also expect some work to be done, uh, uh, you know, uh, some work to be done um, with regards to uh, the security of places to be sure that people even dare to leave their homes and are, 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 can be assured that they can go um, and that they can vote um, uh, without, you know, without being uh, harmed and that independent monitors have access uh, to stations, to polling stations, even in remote areas. I think this is an underrated, but it's a very, very important tool uh, for the integrity of this, uh, of this vote. Thank you. Thank you, Hanan. Uh, Tim? Thank you. So I think it's absolutely clear to everyone that particularly since 2019, the sway of the international um, external actors in Libya is even greater than it was before, and that they can, to a large degree, de determine the, um, the scope of the possible for, for Libyan factions. Um, but at the same time, I've always felt it would be wrong to describe 
uh, Libyan armed groups as proxies of external powers. Clearly, I think, you know, there's, there's a debate sometimes, it's a bit chicken and egg, but people sometimes like to think in a policy term that, you know, the armed groups are the problem, remove the armed groups, and then everything will kind of work. Well, of course, the armed groups are a reflection of a social reality of the lack of trust that we see, of the nature of the political system that's emerged. And these are questions that are still not resolved. And this is completely uh, in keeping with the discussion around the constitution, how Libyans should be governed, and you know the conflagration around Saiful Islam's return, for example. What are the rules? Why should I trust this person? Do I actually need my own armed group? Otherwise, I'm just going to be obliterated by some other guy who doesn't believe in any democratic principle. So my view on this is that always you've got to come at it not just from security issues aren't just security related. You've got to look at those other things, opportunities, um, could be in the economic sphere. You've got to have meaningful reconciliation with these actors. You can't just hope to kind of explain it away or dismiss one set of actors as a spoiler and the other ones as state builders. You have to decide on the kind of state you're trying to build first and have some degree of consensus. And I think that's got to be the goal of the political process. And until you have that block, I don't really think that any meaningful SSR or DDR program can be developed. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Zahra. Thank you, Hanan. Uh, thank you, Anas, for your superb uh, presentations. You have enlightened all of us a bit more about uh, Libyan uh, politics and particularly with regards to the uh, elections, whether they take place in eight days or further uh, down the, the road. Thank you uh, to our audience for joining us today from uh, different countries. And uh, on behalf of Arab Center Washington DC, we're in touch and we invite you to stay in touch with us. We hope to see you in a future event. Thank you very much. Peace to all of you. Bye-bye.